So hi everyone, welcome and good afternoon. My name is Lakeisha Harris. I'm the support programs manager at the Hydrocephalus Association and I will be the moderator for this uh, meeting. We're excited to bring you this live conversation, but before we get started and before we jump into our conversation this afternoon, um, please let me review a couple of housekeeping items. Uh, this information presented to today uh, during today's conversation is int not intended or implied to be a substitute for professional medical advice, diagnosis, or treatment. All content is for general information purposes only. Our guests this afternoon are in no way compensated for their participation. They have generously shared their time to join us to discuss this important topic. Also, the Hydrocephalus Association does not endorse or recommend any commercial products or processes or services. Therefore, the mention of any commercial products, process, processes, or services during our conversation this afternoon cannot be construed as an endorsement or recommendation. Please, all Zoom participants, please keep yourselves muted uh, throughout the conversation. You come, you're currently muted, so please keep yourself uh, muted. Um, participants may use the chat box to type your questions. Please feel, feel free to chat your questions to myself or Trish. Please do not uh, chat the speakers directly as they will not view their chat or answer any chats. Um, I will. I would like to bring to your attention at this time that the meeting is being recorded and due to it being in a meeting format um, and we can see all of your wonderful faces, uh, we are not able to post the recording on our YouTube channel unless everyone gives consent uh, that they are okay with us for posting on our YouTube channel. Um, so let's do a little bit of practice in the chat box. Um, if you do consent to the recording being placed up on our YouTube channel, please chat yes in the chat box. Uh, please feel free to chat myself or Trish privately if you have any questions or concerns. Um, so I would like to see the chat box. Yep, filling up with yes, 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 thank you. I see lots of yeses. Excellent, thank you so much. Um, and then let me take this time to thank our wonderful uh, community network leaders. I see Trish, Trish is on here. I'm looking for uh, Gary, but I don't see him. Uh, those are our wonderful community network leaders who work diligently to uh, answer all of your questions and ensure that you guys have speakers that meet your educational needs. So now I would like to take a moment to thank our speakers for taking the time to share um, on this important topic, approaches to idiopathic normal pressure hydrocephalus. Uh, let me take a moment to just introduce our speakers. First, Dr. Mark, Mark Hamilton is a professor professor of neurosurgery in the Department of Clinical Neurosciences at the University of Calgary, as well as the director of the adult hydrocephalus program there, where he is a practicing neurosurgeon. He is also the chair of the adult hydrocephalus uh, clinical network. He serves on the hydrocephalus association board of directors and is the vice chair of the hydrocephalus association and medical advisory board. So welcome Dr. Hamilton. And then Dr. Darren Lee is an assistant professor in both the department of neurological surgery and the department of psychiatry at the university of Southern California, USC. He is a visiting associate in the Division of uh, Chemistry and Chemical Engineering at the California Institute of Technology. He serves as Director of Cerebral Spinal Fluid Surgery Program and as the Assistant Director of the USC Neuro Restoration Center at USC. So welcome, Dr. Lee. We're very happy to have you. So at this time, I will turn it over to Dr. Hamilton and let him get started with his presentation. Thank you. Uh, and welcome everybody. Um, we're, the, what we're going to do today is I'm going to present a very short uh, presentation. Uh, I've just tried to uh, distill the concepts uh, of uh, diagnosis and treatment for INPH uh, down to some what I think are the relevant uh, sort of uh, uh, essential uh, 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 parts uh, that you should be aware of. And then uh, uh, Dr. Lee is going to uh, uh, tell you about some of the things he does differently. Uh, one of the things uh, you probably encounter if you ever meet with different physicians is that everybody seems to have their own little uh, nuanced approaches to things. Uh, so you're going to hear mine, 
and that's the uh, the bias of it. Uh, and mine is probably from having talked to many people uh, over the years and having done this for many years myself. So I'm just going to share the screen with you. If anybody uh, can't hear me properly, then just sort of wave, wave, but I've tried to put the volume at a reasonable level. Um, no voice. And I'm not getting sharing going. Uh, well, since only one person can share it at a time. Is, is there is somebody else shared? No, Dr. Hamilton, I think you should be able to share. Oh, there it goes now. It did okay. for a sec. Okay, got it. Excellent. Okay. So what you're looking at is a slide that should say improving outcomes. And uh, just sort of back one here. Okay, improving outcomes in patients with suspected INPH. Is that what everybody's seeing? Okay. So uh, what I'm I'm starting the title with suspected INPH because I think that that sort of illustrates what happens when people think you have INPH, and you start a process to sort out whether you actually do or don't. And I think that's where people often, I think, get confused when they um, uh, approach this, because people are often told they have INPH, and then later on somebody tells them they don't. And I think this is just to, to show you how we get to the point of deciding with uh, uh, various uh, you know, parts of the clinical exam, the history, uh, and then the assessments we do, whether uh, it actually fits. And when we can, we can fix this with a shunt. So um, it helps to recognize that there are uh, different types of hydrocephalus. And uh, I bring this up because sometimes people refer to secondary uh, NPH. Uh, if you start reading online, uh, um, the, the terminology is a bit muddled. Uh, I'm not a big fan of secondary NPH. I think that uh, what we, when we're talking about NPH, we should be talking about uh, older adults, and I'll go through some of those uh, uh, um, issues or criteria in a minute. Uh, but secondary NPH uh, was uh, a term used to describe people who look like they had NPH, but they're a lot younger, and there's, there's lots of different causes. So naming something is often challenging and sometimes you get stuck with a name um, and it makes it confusing if you don't sort of understand what that is. So uh, we're gonna be talking about um, INPH, suspected INPH, and generally this is a disease of people over the age of 60. And in some places they actually limit it to 65. It's rare to see somebody younger than that. So this came from, uh, you know, just for the one history slide, 1965, uh, the author of the medal, S. Hakim, Solomon Hakim, you know, uh, he's the guy that uh, did the work that identified the, the idea that you could have uh, big ventricles, weren't very high pressure, not like the typical hydrocephalus that children get, and that it could produce the symptoms. And the symptoms were a gait or balance uh, disorder, uh, cognitive impairment, uh, you know, with, with it getting as bad as dementia, and urinary frequency, urgency, and incontinence. And there are other things that happen with this. Uh, for instance, fecal incontinence probably occurs in a certain percentage of patients at the end. But this is the, what they call the triad. Uh, uh, it is, however, very nonspecific. And lots of people have said, well, I get this when I get older, don't I? And people have dismissed it. And, and if you have cognitive issues, people often uh, you know, link that to Alzheimer's disease and other problems. So I, I, one of the key hallmarks of uh, INPH, if you suspect somebody has it, is not that you necessarily have to have every aspect of this, but I'll, and I'll put that on the tree in a slide in a second, you at least have to have gait and balance problems. Um, if you are somebody who has, you know, pure dementia with not much balance and gait problems at the beginning, then it's unlikely to be uh, INPH. Uh, so the other thing is that when you, uh, to, to, to meet the criteria to be INPH, uh, back when uh, Dr. Hakim identified this, it was the fact that you could improve this by removing spinal fluid. In other words, a shunt operation could help this. Where shunt operations, to our best of our understanding, do not help uh, very much with people with Alzheimer's disease. Now, it's also quite often frequently referred to as a rare disease. Um, 
I think the problem with the rarity aspect is that lots of people just don't look for it. Uh, it's probably much more common. It, I think it is much more common than people uh, generally talk about. And this is from a, uh, a review of the literature that was done. And there's been a couple of uh, reviews like this using very uh, special uh, uh, review techniques and uh, statistics to look at the, uh, uh, the papers that have been published. There are very few places where somebody has gone into a huge population, like take a city. I'm, I'm from Calgary. We went into Calgary and we sampled uh, a whole bunch of people, or we took a, a, the whole city and we scanned everybody and we followed them to determine which ones got INPH. That would give us incidents. What we end up getting is usually prevalence. It's the number of people who are getting shunt operations, the number of people who are being identified through registries as having this disorder. So the numbers are about you know, anywhere from 175 to 400 per 100,000. And a Swedish paper suggested it could be as high as 6% in those over the age of 80. Um, so, you know, and if you just look at those numbers, what does that mean? But let's look at some brain tumor numbers. Everybody knows what a brain tumor is. Uh, you know, there's primary brain tumors and there's glioblastoma, which is, you know, a very malignant brain tumor. It's a brain tumor that you know we often hear about in people who um, you know get a brain tumor and then do not live very long there's a lot of work being done to try and improve it but it's much less common than uh, uh, INPH but much there's much more awareness about it um, so uh, I think the, the it's a mistake to call this a rare disease because it also clouds the way people approach this in centers. So if you're going to, some of the sort of the key things you've got to have. So first of all, you have to have big ventricles. And I'll show you uh, some imaging, a CT scan, MRI scan in a minute. So we, if you don't have big ventricles, then you probably don't have INPH because it's hydrocephalus. Hydrocephalus doesn't necessarily, having big ventricles doesn't necessarily mean that that's a problem at that time. But at least it's the it's the, the the cornerstone. You can't drive a car unless you're in a car. Uh, so I mean that's you have to have big ventricles. For uh, INPH, you have to be at least 65, 60 to sixty five. Uh, however, when you look at the uh, the large series of patients, the average age is about seventy seven to seventy eight. So the sixty year old and sixty five year old tend to be on the younger end of the scale. You should have balance and gait issues. And you, know, you have to frame the, we have to frame the question so that we're not uh, asking somebody something uh, like, you know, in a different uh, sort of stream, if somebody asking somebody if they have headache, they may not use the word headache. So you have to, we have to ask them about falls. Are you having problems with falls? Are you having difficulty getting out of bed in the morning? Are you having difficulty getting to the bathroom? Uh, and have you been able to walk uh, as much? So there are ways to sort of frame this in addition to assessing it. But if you don't have balance or gait issues, you probably don't have INPH. Uh, as I mentioned, if you just have cognitive issues, it's unlikely that you have INPH. And before you start going down the road of, you know, is this possible INPH, you have to make sure you look at the other diagnosis. Does it fit with something else? Does the person have cervical spinal stenosis that might be affecting their balance and gait? Uh, does the person have Alzheimer's disease? Does he, you know, so there are, there are things to sort out right away. Uh, when we see people with big ventricles, we start off with the uh, sort of the, 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 the tenet or the, 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 the basic statement that just because you have big ventricles doesn't necessarily mean that that's causing the problem that you have. So you can't blame it on what you find on the CT or MRI scan yet. You have to go through some things. And the other thing that I always suggest people remember is that not all hydrocephalus effects are reversible. So I think of NPH, INPH as a, just like many other diseases, there's a period where you can identify it and treat it. And there's a period where you might have trouble identifying it. It probably was INPH, but the damage has been permanent. And I'll talk very, very briefly about the natural history at the end. So just because we think you might have INPH, some of the testing we do is actually, it may not, it may, may end up telling you you don't have anything that's treatable at this time, uh, but you may have had INPH. So this is an MRI scan. Uh, and this is just to show uh, like these are tiny ventricles. This is like a slice going through your head just above the forehead. These are bigger ventricles. And this is somebody who's got a shunt in it. 
So if you don't have big ventricles, you don't have hydrocephalus. So let's say you've got some symptoms and you've got an MRI scan or CT scan that shows big ventricles. How do we start with this? So the first thing I was coming back to this is to keep emphasizing this because it is extremely important is make sure something else isn't going on. And that's part of the process that we, in terms of the questionnaires we ask people to fill out, the questions we ask, the physical exam that we do. So when you have the, the symptoms, when you have the imaging showing you have big ventricles, what we're trying to do is determine if the clinical exam and the CTR, CT or MRI scan are compatible with the diagnosis and ultimately are the problems treatable. Um, so, and to do that, we use guidelines. In guidelines, you can think of as sort of like a roadmap. And I'm gonna show you something, and I don't want you to get caught up too much in the complexity of it. But when you look at this, uh, there's three parts to this. This is showing that this bar here, as the farther down you go, the more reliable it is, is the whole, the process has been more reliable in showing you that what, you're, what, what the person has is most likely IMPH and a shunt will help. So if you start up here with just a clinical exam and imaging, you have basically just about a 50% chance. You're flipping a coin. So if you don't, if you just use that, half of the people getting a shunt, if you shunted everybody, would get wouldn't get better. And that's the this was in 2005. And at this time, we're not that much farther along than this. Uh, so what we do is we add um, some additional tests. And the two tests we do in uh, North America and Europe, uh, uh, sorry, North America, Japan, Europe, and in Europe, they do a few other things, but we either do what's called the lumbar puncture or CSF bolus withdrawal or the TAP test uh, or a drainage protocol. And the, both of what these do is try in some way mimic a shunt. So shunts take fluid out of your brain, send it somewhere else. These are tests to remove fluid. If we can get an effect, an improvement with these tests, and that makes you a better candidate for uh, a shunt operation. So that's the, the, the why we put people through this. Because without this, if we had 100 people who had a clinical exam and an MRI scan that suggested INPH, and we put a shunt into everybody, about 50 of those people would not get better. And we don't want people to have surgery that's not going to make them better. So what's next? So part of this process of using the guidelines is to measure things. So um, we said it's gait uh, and cognition and bladder issues. Uh, so there's, if we do a deep dive into this, but I'll just summarize this by saying that we have, we should do some measurement of gait. I'm a big believer in, uh, you know, uh, of trying to use something that not just looking at how somebody's doing, but try to have some measure we can use to help guide us. And we put the two together. So there's different ways people do gait, and we often do these before and after the lumbar puncture or lumbar drain. Uh, and one of them is a 10 meter walk. So you have a 10 meter distance in the hallway and you walk and we time it. We count the number of steps. We watch how many steps it takes to turn. Um, the tug test is called the timed up and go where you get up out of a chair and you walk three meters and back. So there's different tests. They're pretty standardized. Lots of people use them and we use them because they're reproducible. So if, if I'm talking to somebody who is doing this in you know, a different city, different place, and I get a pretty good framework of what, you know, are, are, we're, we're, it's like, it's just like you remove the need for a translator. Um, and then for cognition, there's all kinds of tests people do. Uh, I think if you had to go down to the bare minimum you need, it's a gate. Uh, we, we do a number of cognition tests, but the bare minimum I like for cognition is something called the Montreal Cognitive Assessment Test. Uh, some people will see people using the MMSE, or the Mini Mental Status Evaluation Examination, and it's not quite as sensitive for um, uh, patients as the MOCA. What we've learned is that if we properly select people, uh, all of the symptoms that we see, and we don't have a good test for bladder, but we, we use questionnaires to help gauge how people are doing, but all of these things can improve, but ultimately the degree of improvement is going to depend on how bad things are. So again, coming back to this diagram, if you um, had the symptoms uh, and you had the test and the test was positive, there's a very high probability that you're going to get better if we offer you a shunt. 
So I've already sort of said why we need to do this. It's because just to reinforce this, half of the people with compatible symptoms of big ventricles do not improve after a tap test or lumbar drain. So I think that's, that's its fundamental thing. So I'm just gonna show you, this is a really quick uh, uh, video, but it shows a, oh, sorry, we're having a little flick there. Let's go back. Just try and get this back to where, okay. So this is a patient who had all the symptoms. He had the imaging showing uh, uh, problems with uh, his uh, gait and his cognition. Uh, and you can see he, he's very unsteady when he walks. He's slow. He doesn't clear his feet very well. He takes, he's very uncertain when he turns. And that's what we call the baseline assessment. And then I'm going to show you what it's like after he's had his three-day lumbar drain. I don't need to do much convincing to tell you that that's much better. He turned faster. He walks faster. He's stable. He's not veering. That's great. So this is the kind of th test we like to use. And this guy, this gentleman, his MOCA improved from 20 to 25. So that, that was nice. But his gait improved dramatically. His number of steps to turn decreased. So he was offered surgery. So the surgery that we use is shunts because there is no medical therapy for INPH at this point. Uh, it'd be nice if there was, but at this point, all the little things have been tried, nothing has been effective. So this is uh, just to show you, you know, the effects of the shunt. So if you do a drain and you don't do a shunt, they get better with the drain. They go back, you go back to the way you were. So with a shunt, he continued to improve. So shunts are the mainstay of treatment. And as I mentioned, you're basically just removing spinal fluid from one place and you're sending it to another. If you've heard of this operation called endoscopic third ventriculostomy, in patients who have INPH, it really has a very, very limited role. And usually these are people who have something other than INPH. They're just older patients when they declare. So it's not something that people have demonstrated any effectiveness or efficacy for treatment. There are three types of shunts uh, there's the, that are commonly used. There's all kinds of other little variations on this, but the VP shunt is the most common around that you see around. The VA shunt, particular atrial shunt, and the lumboperitoneal shunt. There's some geographic differences. Uh, there's pluses and negatives for both. Um, this is a, sort of a little cartoon demonstrating that the VP shunt takes a catheter into the brain, has a valve to regulate the flow, and a catheter goes down to the belly. And the VA shunt is the same, except the catheter goes into the vein in the neck and doesn't go quite that far into the atrium. But uh, it basically, you're sending the fluid somewhere else and it gets re reabsorbed or recycled. There's no evidence that any of these are better than the other. People use what they're comfortable in is commonly used around them. Uh, the uh, VP shunt is more commonly used in North America and Europe. The LP shunt a bit more in Asia. Um, my experience has been that you usually can't rely on one type of shunt system for everybody. You need to have a few shunt systems in your, in your pocket to pull out and use, depending on what the issues are. This little cartoon just illustrates what happens with the shunt. It's basically just sending the fluid from the head down through the catheter into the belly. And here you see the catheter is up at the front, but some people also put the catheter in through the back. So there's, very, there's lots of variations. Now, which people are concerned about with shunts is, you know, they, you know, first we want to make sure they work, but do they have problems with shunts? Or are there one of the problems? So shunts can fail. Uh, they, the issues we look at are infection, shunt failure, where it stops functioning. You got better and now you're not better. Uh, or something called overdrainage. <clears throat> I'm not going to dive deep into these. It's just to, we recognize these and we are doing things to try and reduce these. Um, we look at uh, for the uh, the, pro the catheter up at the top to make sure it's in the ventricle. Uh, you want to make sure that the catheter in the belly is in the belly. Uh, and if we're doing uh, different other types of shunts, we look for for different types of markers. Uh, we know from past experience that you know sometimes people can have trouble getting the catheter into the head, um, and so it can be uh, in the wrong location. But the most common problem that occurs in the elderly in adults with uh, INPH or other types of hydrocephalus is the catheter that goes in the belly. And 
it can block uh, uh, for a lot of different reasons, but that's, we look at about 85 to 90% of shunt failure, when it occurs, occurs uh, in the belly, and most of that failure risk is up front or usually in the first year. But shunts can fail at any time afterwards. They can be fixed. Nobody likes to have a second operation, <clears throat> but it's at least reassuring to know that they can usually be fixed. Uh, infection rates, what I mentioned, I mentioned infection briefly. There are simple things we can do to reduce infection rates to less than one or two percent. Nobody wants an infection for obvious reasons, but infection also means you have to take the shunt out, treat with the antibiotics, and then put the shunt back in. So that's multiple procedures. So there's all the, there's different processes and things we can do to make shunt surgery safer and more reliable. Um, but if it does fail, we can fix them. So. Um, Coming back to outcomes, so we've got all, you know, we hopefully have picked people properly, we've done the operation, the operation has hopefully been relatively safe, and then what do you expect uh, in terms of, I showed you a video showing that, that one person uh, was continuing to walk very well after their shunt. First of all, if you don't treat somebody with uh, INPH, uh, it has, uh, I, we're now recognizing uh, high mortality and significant morbidity. In other words, people suffer a lot and die sooner. So this is always, I think, for a long time thought of as a just a disease and people, if you didn't get treated, you got you had to put up with it. But we do know that people die earlier if they don't get treated. This uh, is a paper that came out recently from our uh, Adult Hydrocephalus Clinical Research Network, and we titled it Safety and Effectiveness of the Assessment and Treatment of INPH. And why that title should resonate because it sums up everything that we just talked about. Um, there, it's safe to do the assessments. If you pick the right people, you get the results and the treatments are safe. There are small risks, but the treatments on the whole are safe. And we can see this is two little graphs just to I think illustrate a couple of things. One, if you look at, uh, this is baseline. Remember that walking before we did any testing, after CSF drainage, uh, or sorry, just before CSF drainage, after CSF drainage, um, zero to four months and here at a year. And this is looking at gait velocity. So how fast do you walk? So we first see them in the clinic and they're walking slow. We know that about one meter per second in the elderly is the lower limit of normal. So when you get below that, you're generally not walking safely that, 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 and walking or walking normally. So as they wait just to come in for their tests, they get worse. And it goes along with the natural history uh, element I mentioned. And they have their tests, they get better. They get their shut and they get better and better and better. And they may not get back to totally normal, but they tend to function better. And this is the average of about 400 people. And then for this slide, it shows the change in gait velocity. So what we show here is that about 65, more than 65% of the patients have a very significant change in gait velocity. 80% of the patients have a clinically significant change in gait velocity. So some get really significant change, but just about everybody gets improvement if you select them properly uh, using the process I just outlined. So to put this in, in perspective, I think, you know, shunts, I think, scare people. Nobody likes to have surgery. Nobody wants to have brain surgery, but they're effective. And if you've gone through the right steps, uh, if your physicians uh, have gone through the right steps, it, it, it's a good operation for people. Uh, the alternative, I think, is, is quite discouraging if you don't do anything. Uh, if they malfunction, they can be fixed, and we can make them work again. Um, although shunts can block, and there are some complications, most of them are minor, uh, and not life-threatening. And we still keep trying to find ways to improve this. And just the last uh, uh, comment I want to make is about longitudinal care. So I am a firm believer in the need for ongoing care. I don't consider hydrocephalus to be, uh, um, and Dr. Williams likes to refer to uh, the scenario of one and done. In other words, you, you do the shunt operation, pat the person on the back and say, you know, have a good life. Uh, shunts can fail. Um, and this is from Dr. Williams. Shunts and ETVs can stop working. You can develop delayed infections. 
uh, headaches can develop, problems can develop, shunts can malfunction. So we need to follow people. You may not have to come in every six months. You may only have to come in every one or two years. But you more most important thing is you have a place to call. So that's the way we function with our clinic. You know, we, we struggle like everywhere keeping up with numbers, but we want people to call us if they're having a problem and we prioritize that to try and, try and assess and fix their problems. Not every problem that somebody has when they have a shunt is related to their shunt. Uh, but once we've gone through that sorting out process, if it is a shunt, then we can then go ahead and fix it. And that is where I will stop. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Hamilton. Now we can turn it over to you, Dr. Lee. Thank you. Uh, that was a uh, excellent overview, uh, Dr. Hamilton. Um, you know, I, I don't think I disagree with any of the uh, of what what you talked about from you know diagnosis to treatment. Um, I do. We do kind of have a slightly different, um, I guess, workflow uh, when it comes to how we diagnose, um, treat, and and follow. But again, we agree. Uh, wholeheartedly with the the long term follow up, um, so you know I guess basically uh, there's just a few things that we're, we kind of do slightly different um, uh, at USC. Uh, so we do have a uh, normal pressure hydrocephalus clinic. Um, um, I'm sure Dr. Hamel can can kind of expound on how they kind of work on it. But um, when a patient referred to to our clinic, um, we're, they're evaluated actually. Kind of as a almost a one stop shop um, by myself, um, our, a physical therapist, an uh, occupational therapist, and um, potentially a neurologist, depending on um, who is the the referring provider. Um, and then in terms of the evaluation, even before doing any sort of um, a CSF uh, removal, um, like I said, they they're seen by physical therapists, um, and here. Again, similarly, we do the timed up and go test, um, but we also do a, a few other tests. Um, again, just looking at a little more of the specifics. One is a five times sit to stand. So we have a patient uh, sit and stand up a number of times. There's a dynamic gait index that we use um, and a fast walking speed. Um, from the cognitive assessments, we do have our occupational therapist um, uh, do a, a short evaluation. And again, similarly, doing the MOCA test um, that, like Dr. Handel mentioned, but we also have a couple of other tests that we have them uh, evaluate on, that being the uh, uh, Stroop color word test, um, uh, some, some sort of like simple digit type tests, and then some anti uh testing. Um, we also have them fill out, as Dr. Handel mentioned, a, um, uh, a urinary uh, incontinence questionnaire, specifically a, a neurogenic bladder symptom score, uh, and then the incontinence uh, urodynamic evaluation. And we actually have a, we're fortunate to, to have a, a neurourologist as well uh, to help um, kind of the evaluation uh, as needed, uh, per, uh, depending on the, the sympt symptoms. Um, after we have the patient come through our, our clinic, we usually uh, will send them uh, home and then have a small little case conference to determine um, based upon the imaging, uh, and their clinical evaluation, whether or not we think the patient's uh, a good candidate for a CSF uh, removal. Uh, most of the time, we will actually uh, do it as a lumbar drain trial, as opposed to a uh, kind of a one-time lumbar puncture test, um, mostly just to make sure that we uh, have a, what we think is a, a more stable kind of evaluation across uh, multiple time points. So the patients are usually admitted um, to the hospital, uh, the lumbar drain is placed over the course of, excuse me, uh, three days. And then our physical therapist and occupational therapist will actually evaluate uh, daily for those three days to see if there's any changes. Um, at the end of the, the, I guess, third or fourth day, the, the lumbar drain is removed and the patient's discharged. Um, we'll then have another kind of little case conference between the physical therapist, occupational therapist, and um, myself and neurologist. Um, and again, going over imaging, determine if we think uh, that there was a uh, meaningful response from the CSF removal. Um, and then we proceed again. Uh, if they're, they are um, deemed a good candidate, then moving forward generally with a ventricular peritoneal shunt. If they're not deemed a good candidate, then they're the, the we're kind of just uh, we discuss again with the patients either 
uh, primary care or neurologist to say that we don't think that this is potentially NPH and then uh, you know other potential uh, workups need to be done, for instance, things like Parkinson's disease or Alzheimer's disease. Um, a little bit, I guess a little bit more on the specifics uh, with the ventricular peritoneal shunt. Um, I saw on Dr. Hamilton's uh, kind of figures and cartoons that they uh, do, or it appears that they do a uh, prior occipital shunt. Uh, correct me if that's not the case, but uh, basically placing the catheter in the back of the head. Um, I, I typically do a, a frontal uh, ventricular peritoneal shunt, and um, I assume that this is the same way with uh, Dr. Hamilton, but almost predominantly on the right side of the brain. Um, and then, uh, you know, because we try to get these kind of more uh, objective measures again with our physical therapist and occupational therapist. Um, and so we usually see the patients um, uh, probably at uh, you know, two weeks uh, after the initial surgery. And then we see them again at one month, uh, three months and a year, and then yearly after that. Um, uh, just to make sure that they uh, see if there's any sort of uh, significant changes. Um, we will occasionally, oh, we, uh, it's pretty typical that we use for our shunts, um, adjustable valves. So valves that can, um, we can adjust the amount of pressure um, that we're, or how much CSF we're kind of taking off um, for a couple of reasons. One, um, I think Dr. Handelman mentioned that there's a possibility for kind of over drainage. So we can use these uh, valves to kind of reduce the amount of drainage if we need to, or potentially increase the amount of drainage to see if there's potentially some effects with uh, changing mm -hmm. the amount of flow. But again, in general, um, we, again, we believe in kind of these long-term follow-up with, with patients um, in, in terms of one, just checking and seeing how, how you're doing, uh, but also just to make sure that there is no um, potential malfunctions. And if there were to be some sort of malfunction or suspected malfunction, um, usually we do imaging like a, a CT or a CAT scan of the head, or some x-rays to make sure that there's no breakage or uh, malplaced uh, catheters. Um, if we see nothing wrong and there's still persistent uh, problems, we may consider uh, doing a shunt function study. So uh, injecting a tracer into the, the valve to make sure that the tracer actually flows, through, uh, that the shunt is actually properly working uh, throughout. Um, but again, the, the not, very significantly different, I think, uh, than uh, Dr. Hamilton's uh, approach. Uh, outside of maybe uh, the not doing the the lumbar puncture as frequently, we'll do it. But uh, generally, that's for patients who we just don't think would pretty much tolerate uh, a, lo a longer hospital stay. I, I think I use but lumbar puncture for less than a quarter of patients. Uh, uh, I think it's not as sensitive. If you fail a lumbar puncture, you don't have a positive response, then they go up automatically to a lumbar drain. Uh, um, and the lumbar drains certainly are much more resource. They, they take a lot more time in the hospital. People have to be in the hospital. But that, that still makes up more than three quarters of what we do. I think there are some institutions that will go to lumbar puncture first um, and, and then kind of go from there. But um, yeah, like I said, I think... We think it's quite, quite a bit more sensitive than the lumbar drain trial. I th and I think what you know, we're, you're hearing from both of us is that uh, the sort of the endpoints are often is, are, are very similar. The pathways may be a little different, but the principles are the same as we sort of both navigate this. Uh, I, 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 do, I agree firmly with uh, the idea of using programmable valves. Um, uh, I, I worked in an era where we didn't have programmable valves, and I would never go back. Um, and they've gotten better, but valves are more research needs to be done in terms of making them uh, even uh, better than they are now. When I, I, I do my, my shots mostly posteriorly. When, uh, when I initially trained, uh, again, uh, my uh, mentors would always use a uh, fixed pressure valve. So that's something that kind of I moved away from, I guess. So. Yeah. So uh, that's a general overview. I'll turn it back and we'll uh, see if there are particular questions. So we can, yes. uh, things that we muddled or muddled, muddled the waters more or um, <laughs> hopefully uh, not too much. Yes, thank you. That was a great overview, Dr. Hamilton and Dr. Lee. I, I want to go back to, you know, 
and for diagnosis purposes, the guidelines for diagnostic uh, testing or tools, uh, the tap versus the uh, drain. So do you, just a two, two uh, part question, do you prefer one over the other? I think Dr. Hamilton, you missing it, mentioned that if it fails, then you go onto the drain, but is it initially do the drain and then uh, see how things go? If it doesn't go well, then you move on to the drain. How do you decide or determine? Uh, myself personally, uh, we look at uh, how uh, much impairment there is. So somebody who is very impaired, it's less likely that one lumbar puncture is going to make enough change to make us con to convince us that this is we're on the right pathway. So though people at that state, and it's there's a number of different criteria we use, but the, the concept is the degree of impairment. Um, if we're looking for uh, a cognitive effect, then we'll definitely would do a drain um, because uh, with a lumbar puncture, there's not enough volume or time uh, associated with it to actually get much of a change. Many places don't even bother testing the MOCA after the lumbar puncture. Uh, the, lum the lumbar drain is more sensitive because it is removing more fluid over a longer period of time. And that's the general impression that most of us have. So uh, I do know centers where they just can't do uh, lumbar drains uh, because they're not set up for it. They don't have um, the access to beds for it. And in which case a lumbar puncture is still a valid option, but it then becomes more difficult when you have people who don't have a response or a convincing response as to what to do with them. Uh, we didn't get into the topic of delayed assessments. But most of us assess people two or three hours after lumbar puncture. Um, but we also, uh, lots of centers now are sending people home with diaries or we're calling them or having them call us two days later, three days later and tell us if things have changed, if they are, we bring them back and we assess them. Um, so there's, um, you can do a lot with the large volume tap, but it is not the, the most sensitive test. Dr. Lee, do you want to share anything? Sure. Uh, yeah, so I mean, it, again, similarly, we, we typically will go uh, first with a lumbar drain. Uh, the only times we, we really will do lumbar puncture is if, like I said, we don't think that the patients are going to be, uh, uh, one, kind of amenable to staying overnight, you know, uh, a couple nights or a few nights in a row. Um, uh, that, that can sometimes be the, the difference. Um, and then potentially, uh, yeah, I mean, the, the, we basically will go to lumbar drain almost exclusively. We, we do it occasionally, the lumbar puncture, um, when patients don't want to, and we kind of give them that, that choice. Um, but, uh, you know, we've, I've had a number of patients where they've, uh, and this is sometimes for kind of insurance reason, but they did an L lumbar puncture, and it was very equivocal whether or not there's any benefit. Um, uh, but then we had to kind of fight for a lumbar drain trial, and and the patient got significant improvement with the lumbar drain trial, uh, so eventually got a shunt. But I think upfront we weren't sure, and I didn't want to commit them to a shunt without knowing that I, you know, having a, a high um, probability that they'd improve before placing the shunt. Uh, I can say from our our uh, experience that about half of the people who have a negative lumbar puncture test. We go on, if we take all those and put, they go into a drain, about half to two thirds do not have a positive lumbar, dra lumbar drain experience. And they don't get better at the lumbar drain. So um, there's still a lot of work that needs to be done to try to, to, to build the, you know, a better understanding of all this. Uh, I think the lumbar tap is a good test for many people, but it is just, you just have to be aware that it's not as sensitive. Thank you. There are times where I do receive calls where patients say, you know, they they did not receive a tap or a drain and they just went straight to shunting. Is there any time that, you know, you can you consider just going straight to shunting? Okay. So I, I keep saying my giving my biases first, but uh, if uh, Dr. Lee wants to talk first, go ahead. But I, uh, I will pipe it. I wouldn't, time. I wouldn't. Uh go straight to a shunt. So, so I, I, I think uh, I have, have I've done it very infrequently. I made a conscious decision a long time ago to 
use the best evidence that we had to avoid having a lot of people have shunts. And I had been doing shunts without tests for a number of years before I changed my mind and uh, started doing this way. So I, I, and I was not happy with the predictability. So I, uh, there are some people are looking for um, another marker. They're looking for an MRI change. They're looking for a clinical change, a neuropsychology change, something that will let us pick people much in a much more easy fashion. And at this point, no matter what you read, it doesn't exist. So there's a thing called DESH, which people may have read about, uh, disproportionately enlarged subarachnoid hydrocephalus. And after you say what it means, you realize why everybody just says DESH. Uh, but it's, a, it's an MRI feature, a CT feature, uh, that when it first started being talked about, people thought, well, this is it. This is all you need. And that is not the case. Uh, I have many patients with DESH who do not get better, and many patients who get better who do not have DESH. So um, I, I reserve shunting without testing to specific rare circumstances. I don't think it's best practice. Excellent. Thank you so much. Uh, just one more question on diagnosis, and this is more so geared towards determining whether it's MPH or not. How do you determine if a patient has uh, hydrocephalus ex vacuo? What, what, is hydro, what is a hydrocephalus ex vacuo? vacuo? And is it, is it related to MPH? Is it different from MPH? Yeah, so hydrocephalus ex vacuo is more of a, um, it's a, it's re refers to increased space in the brain, can be in the brain cavities, usually because of loss of brain substance. Um, and uh, it, it could be after a stroke, after a head injury, brain injury, it can be with, uh, you know, at the end stages of you know, things like Alzheimer's disease, um, as we age, our ventricles get larger. So I mentioned at the beginning that you have to have big ventricles, but you even have to understand what is normal big ventricle, what is normal for a, an 85-year-old is different from what is normal for a 40-year-old. So um, I, it's not a term that we use. I don't think I've actually used the phrase hydrocephalus ex vacuo for 15 years. Um, I think we talk in terms of the other uh, aspects, uh, and you can have people can have had a stroke or subarachnoid hemorrhage uh, from an aneurysm and, and develop hydrocephalus, and they may have big ventricles, they may have had damage to part of their brain, but they can still respond. So it becomes much much more complex than that particular term. So again, not a big fan of it. I don't, yeah, I don't, I don't have anything to add. I, I don't, we don't really use that either. Um, I mean, occasionally I will see this on a radiology report and I just kind of move on. So. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. So now let's move on to treatment uh, questions. And uh, Dr. Hamilton, he went through the, the different types of shunts. Um, would VP be in the most common? How do you determine uh, which shunt, which shunt would, you, would VP be uh, VA or LP. Um. I, I think he, uh, Dr. Hamilton alluded to this before, but it's really kind of uh, surgeon dependent. Um, I think a lot of the times it's it, it's a way of doing um, CSF diversion and how comfortable you are uh, doing uh, the different types of approaches. I think everybody's, uh, every neurosurgeon really kind of goes and has learned the ventricular peritoneal shunt approach. Um, I think that the in general, uh, at least like in North America and Europe, the ventricular atrial shunt is probably less, and ventricular pleural shunts are, are less uh, are less commonly done, mm -hmm. partly because of access. Um, um, and then the LP shunt, I, again, I think is probably less commonly done. I, I mean, at least in our center, we have the avail availability to do all of them, but I think typically we'll, we will do the ventricular peritoneal shunt more commonly. Um, I guess if there's a contraindication to putting it um, into the belly, then we we may go into a different uh, a location like the heart or lung. Um, but um, again, I, I think it's probably most likely uh, uh, surgeon dependent. One reason I do put it in, let's say the lung, uh, and it would be for normal pressure hydrocephalus is because I want to create a, uh, a pressure gradient and pull more fluid out um, but that, that's not going to be the case in NPH. As, as I, 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 I agree, I, I think most, most of us, 
if you're going to look after patients and uh, and be able to uh, treat with shunts, you need to know more than one shunt. Um, there is no difference, as I mentioned, in terms of what's better. Um, there, we've talked about the possible differences at our meetings, and we all have our own biases. Um, I have a number of colleagues from Japan who really do a lot more lumboperitoneal shunts, but it's different body habitus and lumboperitoneal shunts. Um, I mean, if you're uh, North America and Europe tend to have a bigger weight uh, than uh, much of Japan, it's a little easier to do in certain areas. Um, each of these has their own challenges, positives, negatives. Um, I think the reason that most people use VP shunts is because that's what most people have been trained to do. And they need to know how to do something well. Uh, and if they're doing a lot of it, they need to know some alternatives. So my alternative is the VA shunt. Um, nobody's ever done a study that's compared VA shunts with VP shunts head to head. And so I, I, it's it's something that's needed needs to be done at some point, but hasn't been done. So if your surgeon feels confident with the technology, the approach they're using, again, whether it's catheter up front, catheter at back, whether it's uh, VP shunt, VA shunt, uh, how they do it, and they can tell you they get good results and they're looking at the results, then I, at this point, there's nothing to say that that's wrong. Okay. And then Dr. Lee mentioned it first about positioning, and you just kind of mentioned up front or back. Why why do you select the right or the left versus the left side? Well, the, the right side is usually done because it's a non-dominant side and we're all right-handed. Okay. And uh, and you're, so if you do have some, if something bad did happen in the left side, your left-sided shunt, you might have a risk of affecting speech and some other functions that would be unique to that part of the brain. It's also the fact that we're, as a surgeon, most of us surgeons are right-handed and we tend to get used to working in a certain approach, a certain way. Um, and it, again, most of the surgeons were taught by people who did it on the right side and it just, it carries on that way. There, there's, there's nothing wrong with doing it on the left if you have to, uh, but I think the, 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 the first sort of aligned for most of us is, uh, or first approach is right side. Okay, thank you. And after shunt placement, would you ever consider removing the shunt if the patient is not improving? I, I typically uh, don't. Uh, I mean, if it's bothering them uh, to, to a certain extent, then then I'd potentially offer. Uh, then I would offer it. But um, in general, I think that um, at least from my point of view, another surgery is uh, another surgery. So uh, increases whatever risk there were in the first time. Um, I don't think that it's a dangerous operation to remove the shunt by any means, um, but generally I'm, I don't uh, kind of uh, suggest it, but again, I'm not opposed to removing it. And I, I, I'd i second that. I mean, you don't, uh, uh, nobody should have an operation unless there's a perceived benefit and unless that was causing pain or dysfunction or it had become infected, in which case it would have to be removed. There's no real value in uh, taking it out, and there's no danger usually in leaving it in. Okay. Is there a uh, clamp it off instead of removing it? Can you clamp it off? Or I hear patients say they turned it off or clamped it off. Um, depending on the shunt. Mm -hmm. Depending on the shunt valve. So um, certain some shunt valves, you can virtually turn it off. Okay. Uh, so, but so you can all programmable valves you can turn up to their maximum settings, so they're less likely to drain. And for somebody with INPH, they tend not to have high CSF pressures. For many of those people, that really does effectively virtually turn it off. Uh, but the only way to, to stop a valve from draining is to remove it or tie it off. And yeah, that requires a surgery. Um, so uh, it you know, if they're not going to use it, we'd usually just turn it up to the highest level uh, mm -hmm. and just leave it there. Okay. So um, what do you do to determine if a shunt um, is still working um, after implantation, you know, three or more years, um, but the patient still presents maybe one or two classic symptoms? I kind of went to my, my work up uh, previously, but you know, usually I want to get uh, some basic imaging just to make sure that there's no uh, 
you know, fracture of the, the, the catheter, that the catheters look like they're in the right place. Um, but if I'm concerned, um, you know, I will do some kind of adjustments uh, with the valve to see if there's any changes, um, to, if with, let's say, increased flow or not. Um, sometimes I can, you can tap the valve um, and put a needle into the valve, see if there's flow. Um, and if that's, you know, equivocal, then I would consider putting a, a radio tracer or a nuclear medicine chunk function study. Yeah, so one of the advantages of doing um, some objective measures like gate velocity or uh, uh, a cognitive test is that you then, it's like having your blood pressure recording. So you come back to the office, the, the, uh, you get your blood pressure checked, they're not going to hold your arm and tell you that your blood pressure feels good. They're going to measure it. So we will, uh, you know, we can do a simple 10 meter gate. So if some, uh, first of all, we start by just asking how they're doing. And we ask the people they're with how they're doing. So we get both sides of that. If they're doing well, then the odds are the shunt's doing what it's supposed to do. Uh, we can confirm that with a simple test. You don't have to do all the tests every time. If there's a concern, we, we start by looking at what's happened to the gate velocity and their balance is off, uh, then we, you know, that raises the level of concern. But just like I mentioned, with the, uh, when you start with somebody who doesn't have a shunt, you have to go through that differential diagnosis. The majority of times when somebody's having a, a, a spell of worsening, it, you have to look for the other things that could be causing that. So it could be a bladder infection in some people, or it could be they develop spinal stenosis in the lumbar area or spinal stenosis in the, in the neck. Um, it, we've had patients who have developed uh, delayed uh, uh, subdurals. Uh, you know, so there's, there's all kinds of different things. So we just we work our way through it. Uh, a CT scan, depending on how long it's been since the last one. Uh, I, I do like nuclear medicine shunt studies. That's where you inject the shunt and you watch the tracer. Um, and it's most of these tests aren't, there's not one definitive test, but you put them together and you sort of come up with a, an idea of whether you think the shunt is under-functioning, over-functioning. And then um, if it's under-functioning, we usually will try and open it up a bit more. And depending on how bad the shunt study is, you may, you know, like the, the chances of that working vary. It does work, so we try it for some people. And if that doesn't work, we go on and fix the shunt. Excellent, that answered my, how do you manage the shunt? I'll tell your question. Um, so if, um, what is after shunt placement, uh, someone develops a hygroma, what is a hygroma and how do you treat it? So hygroma uh, is usually identified on the CT scan. It's uh, by definition, a hygroma is a collection of clear fluid, so it's probably spinal fluid on the surface of the brain. So when you go from the scalp, you then hit bone underneath the scalp, then there's a lining underneath the bone called dura, and then so subdural, in the subdural space between the brain and the, that lining, you can get fluid. So that fluid can also occasionally have bleeding into it, in which case you then get something called a chronic subdural hematoma. So under the dura, and it's chronic because it usually bleeds and builds slowly. And they are both the effects of what we've heard as term overdrainage. So the, the brain in people with INPH is not, uh, is, is stiffer than it is when with kids. Kids often, if you have big ventricles, you drain the fluid, the brain's like a sponge to some degree and expands. In adults, um, as we get older, it gets worse. Uh, the brain does not expand. So we're taking just enough fluid off to make the brain function better. But if we take too much off, the brain starts to sag, starts to sink a bit. So that's the value of adjustable valves. It's like we can, they're not, it doesn't work quite like a tap, but we can make it harder to drain, easier to drain. So some hygromas are irrelevant, not causing a problem, too small to be worried about. And if nothing else, they identify that the shunt's working. Some hygromas, depending on the size, could be worrisome. It could be big enough that they could be could causing some pressure, or we're concerned that they're going to have bleeding into them and develop into a chronic subdural hematoma. And if the patient's not doing bad, you know, is, is, is still functioning well, at least isn't causing a major problem, we usually start by making the valve harder to drain. We, we adjust the valve and then back off on that. And then when that goes away, we start moving forward again with the settings. So that we each have our own sort of, you know, all of us have sort of process, uh, sort of process maps that we use to try and work this or algorithms. Uh, we want to keep people out of trouble. And that, that's why 
And the highest risk for this is actually very in the first six months to a year, probably in the first six months. So you tend to get a few more CT scans in the first six months, or if you make a valve adjustment to make it drain more, you get you tend to get a CT scan follow-up to make sure it's not working too well. And Dr. Lee, would you like to add anything to that? Oh no, 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 that that that's yeah, there's nothing else that I need to. Okay. Um, and so I get, I think I hear this all the time in my call, uh, during the calls or on the NPH Facebook page, uh, where they have ringing in the ears. So, and it, we wanted to know if this is a condition that develops like tinnitus develops after shunt placement, is it common? Is it related to, uh, you know, having a shunt? Well, I, th I think, uh, I mean, tinnitus, there can be a number of causes of, of tinnitus. Um, and so first we probably would want to rule out, um, the other causes first. Um, uh, sometimes it can be due to uh, a vascular lesion, um, or sometimes it can even be, uh, be the, I guess, a subsequent um, potentially a uh, developed from, I guess, shunt placement. But um, again, first want to rule out um, these other kind of other causes. Um, sometimes it can also be some sort of uh, otolaryngitis, like ear actual ear problem, and not related to the shunt. So I usually also have um, patients see um, their ears, nose, and throat doctor, or, or ears, nose, and throat doctor, uh, potentially. Uh, but I, I have uh, seen it occasionally uh, develop um, uh, after shunt, uh, shunt placement, um, and very rarely, but I, I've occasionally uh, tried moving the shunt to a different location um, to see if that also potentially would um, help it resolve. And I have seen that happen before where moving the shunt um, did cause some a change in their um, their symptoms. I, 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 so tinnitus in itself is often the ringing in the ear. Um, I, um, I, I think it's not uncommon to see people over 65, 70 who have tinnitus to begin with. I think the thing I get concerned about with shunts is if they develop what we refer to as hypoacusis. In other words, you lose some hearing, and it's like having your ear underwater, you know, water in your ear. Uh, and it's, uh, that uh, can occasionally occur with, uh, um, and occasion, I say occasionally, it's probably more common, it's more common than rare. It's not everybody, but it's like in the probably five plus percent range. And it really depends on um, how much drainage is occurring. So it's, it's another over drainage uh, symptom. Uh, an over drainage symptom, another one, by over drainage, it means you, for a momentarily or for a prolonged period of time, you, we've got too much CSF going through your shunt system. And so people will sometimes get that when they stand up, they'll get a, a headache. They just won't go away until they lie down again. Because when you stand up, you, your shunt drains more, it siphons more uh, by the way the valve works. So, um, and, and sometimes with, uh, the, the, that sensation of water in the ear, dull, dullness, like you're trying to listen underwater, uh, you, um, we can adjust the shunt. Uh, most people, you can find a setting that it goes away. Some people have, you know, if, if the, the walking is better when they have that and the walking's not as good when they don't have it, and then it becomes a bit of a, you know, what, what do you want? What, what, what is, what, what's the, you know, the worst of the two for some one person? And so it's, it's, it's usually manageable. Uh, lots of times people just don't, Sometimes we forget to ask, and sometimes people don't bring it up. So we've tried to make it a more structured part of our evaluation. Same with the headaches. Uh, one, one actually add addition to that, I guess, is you know I, I do adjust the shunt before I revise the shunt. Um, one other potential thing that we've used in the past is um, putting a anti-siphon uh, guard, so prevent uh, a additional piece that kind of prevents siphoning as well. So there, that, that's another potential option if you don't put a, a valve in that already has this kind of anti-siphon guard in the first place. Yeah, I, I would agree with that. I think that uh, it's very valve dependent. Uh, I had uh, one valve that I used uh, for a long time that I never used an anti-siphon device unless they developed a problem way down the road because it was very uncommon to see uh, significant over drainage. And, but it's part of the valve I currently use because it, it just, we need it to avoid over drainage for a lot of patients. So I think everybody just needs to be aware of it and understand why we're doing these tests at particular times. If you have these symptoms, bring them up so we can try and sort them out. 
Agree. Thank you. And so now we're going to move a little bit out of treatment into a research question. Um, are you familiar with the a recent astronaut study on perivascular spaces? If yes, uh, can you explain a little bit about uh, if the astronaut shows symptoms compatible with MPH, a little bit about the research? The, uh, so the only astronaut stuff I've been familiar with, or I am familiar with is the, um, they have not identified uh, major changes in their imaging from what I understand. Uh, what they've been trying to do is sort out why uh, astronauts complain of um, uh, visual changes, uh, and is that related to a change or increase in ICP? Astronauts have there's been no astronaut that I'm aware of has ever had any symptoms compatible with INPH or NPH. Uh, uh, they would none of them would qualify for a diagnosis of INPH because. Uh, I think uh, a 65 year old astronaut would be a rare thing. Uh, mm -hmm. So it's, a, it's the things that they're looking at for the spinal fluid and brain physiology and the astronauts, I think, really fall into a different category, a way totally separate from, from INPH. Okay. Same yeah, thing. I don't have anything to add to that. <laughs> okay. Well, the last question. Um, so, what are the lessons learned for you for you both in uh, prog problems of recognition in treating NPH patients? Well, I think you know it comes down to the the fact that we don't have the the best uh, the perfect tools to uh, diagnose NPH at this point. Um, I think that there's a lot of us who are very interested in trying to figure out how we can, you know, possibly avoid number one, uh, you know, having to do these lumbar drain trials or up the lumbar punctures uh, and still be able to diagnose it. Um, you know, we're, I know that for us, we're trying to do a number of kind of various uh, advanced imaging studies to see if we can try to correlate changes um, that might be associated with uh, the underlying pathophysiology, which I, I think none of us really understand. Um, but at the same time, you know, there is this, um, you know, pro uh, you know, problem that, that, we can at least uh, help or alleviate a number of these symptoms um, with the shunting procedure. I think it would be great if we could figure out what, again, what the underlying process is so we don't have to have a, a shunt. But um, at this point, you know, there's a number of kind of workflow uh, ish, uh, processes that we're using to try to uh, minimize the, one, the the misdiagnosis, and then subsequently minimize the, the um, complications that occur with uh, shunt placement. Um, but I think that uh, you know having close or not close, but um, long term follow up again is is a key um, point of uh, point that we need to make sure we have, and then having these objective measures. Well, I could uh, I was just at the uh, Hydro twenty twenty two meeting uh, where um, it's the first time we've been able to get together in three years because of COVID, uh, um, and it sort of it highlighted a lot of these issues. Uh, that relate to that question. Uh, um, I think at this point, uh, and the reason I went through uh, the talk uh, at the beginning in the way I did was to say that uh, there's there's lots of things being done, uh, but I'm uh, essentially a, what I refer to as a pragmatist. If you, you still have to you know, do all the things to make uh, shunts function better, you still have to do all the things to pick people with the current best tools we have for surgery so we're not offering unnecessary surgery. And we have to, while we're doing that, we need to be working on trying to make it better. And there's actually you know, a clinical trial that we're a part of where we're not just trying to make it better, we're trying to prove to the people who don't really get this disease that shunts work. Uh, and that's, that's a, uh, you know, a study that uh, we've done the pilot and now we're doing the formal study with NIH funding. Um, it's, I think it's essential that this idea that people can pick people uh, by their clinical symptoms and imaging reliably, that is just 99% of the time, this time wrong. Um, so people need, to, we need to use these tests to avoid these other problems. And I've, I had a part of my career where I didn't use these tests and you know, um, I, I, I'm a firm believer in the need at this time and an optimist that at some point we won't need to do lumbar drains and lumbar punctures, but it's what we have right now. And uh, I think that uh, we all, um, 
10, 15 years from now, we'll have a, to be a different conversation, I'm sure, uh, but we're not there yet. Excellent. Thank you so much, Dr. Lee and Dr. Hamilton. That was a great presentation. Uh, thank you everyone for um, keeping muted and helping us run through this presentation very smoothly. We hope you learned something. We appreciate our, our speaker's time. At this time, we're going to conclude the meeting. Uh, everyone, we do have an active NPH network. I am putting the link in the chat. If you did not join, please consider joining. Um, and thank you to our community network leaders again. Trish and Gary for helping to make all of this possible for you guys. Uh, everyone, please have a wonderful rest of your day. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Lee and Dr. Hamilton. Thank you. Right. Bye, everybody. Bye.